All right, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the stuff that I've been working on in astronomy, uh, exploding stars, dark energy, and the runaway universe. So here is a picture of a galaxy. OK, we've gotten that far. Great. Uh, so this is a galaxy similar to our own Milky Way galaxy. Uh, it, we say it's similar. It's not our Milky Way. We don't have a long enough selfie stick to take our own picture in the Milky Way. <laughs> Uh, but it's similar to our own. Uh, Dr. Dustbuster showed us a few pictures of normal galaxies, and this is a pretty normal galaxy. It's got a core of stars in the middle, the nucleus, about 100 billion stars in there. It's got some spiral arms, dusty dark arms that we just heard about, and some brighter arms. It's kind of tilted on its side. We can't really see the spiral arms. I'll show some pictures later where we can see those better. Uh, way down in the core, much smaller than the laser pointer dot, is a black hole, a supermassive black hole. That's not the subject of this talk. What's the subject of this talk is this bright star in the bottom corner. So this is a picture of a single star in this galaxy that has exploded. This was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in 1994. And here is one star in that galaxy that's gone supernova and has become about as bright as the core of about 100 billion stars. So the explosive death of the star, the supernova that I study, is extremely powerful, extremely energetic. In one month, a supernova will go, give off the same amount of energy as the sun does in its entire 10 billion year lifetime. The material exploded outward from a supernova can travel at 10% the speed of light. And in one supernova explosion, you can make enough iron to make 5,000 Earths. So these are hugely powerful, hugely fast, bright explosions of a star. So Fritz Zwicky is one of the characters in the history of astronomy. I know for a fact that we've heard about him at at least five AOTATX talks over the last year and a half or so. Uh, he is a curmudgeonly fellow, as you might have imagined. Uh, Swiss astronomer, worked at Caltech for most of his life. Uh, one of the many parts of astronomy that he had a big hand in was supernova research uh, back in the mid-20th century. Uh, he is famous for calling astronomers and, and people he didn't like spherical bastards, because they were bastards any way you looked at them. <laughs> so as I said, uh, one of the topics that he worked on a lot was supernova. He was sort of the, the, one of the fathers of, of modern supernova observations. He coined the phrase supernova. Uh, it's sort of a, a mashup of the word nova, Latin for new. This word was used by the ancients for a new star that popped up in the night sky. He added the prefix super to denote these very powerful explosive deaths of a star, as opposed to the smaller cousins, the classical nova, which I will not talk about today. And so humanity has been seeing supernovae for thousands of years, basically as long as recorded history and probably longer. Uh, and we have some records of them. Here is a famous picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. This is the amateur astronomers, which nebula? Crab Nebula, yeah, yeah, a lot of people around there know it. So this is the Crab Nebula in the constellation of Taurus. This is a supernova remnant, so a star explodes, it blasts out material very fast. That material will run into the stuff, the dust and the gas between stars, minding its own business, smacks into it, heats up, lights up, and we get a supernova remnant. And so this remnant, the Crab Nebula supernova remnant, is what's left over from a star that exploded in the year 1054. So there was a supernova about a thousand years ago, and this is what it looks like a thousand years later from the Hubble Space Telescope. So the Crab supernova in the year 1054 uh, was observed by basically every uh, civilization in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, Native American tribes in, in uh, North America and Northern South America, uh, uh, astronomers in the Middle East and, and the Far East. And, you know, Europe was having some issues around the year 1054, but there might be, might be some records. Uh, it's unclear exactly. Uh, so this is one such possible, this has been called into question, but possible observation of the 1054 supernova. This is from Chaco Canyon, New Mexico. The Anasazi uh, uh, people made this uh, petroglyph, uh, this rock drawing of, uh, you know, a new star. Maybe it's Venus, maybe it's the 1054 supernova. Uh, this, the moon at the time was a crescent in sort of this direction from this new thing. And then the artist put uh, their hand up there for a sense of scale. So maybe, you know, a thousand years ago, this was somebody's PhD thesis. I don't know. <laughs> so here's a time lapse from an amateur astronomer of a supernova going off. So again, this is an amateur astronomer, dark site, relatively small telescope. Uh, again, we have a spiral uh, a galaxy sort of tilted on its side. Not quite as pretty and detailed as the Hubble picture, but that's okay. It's just, you know, solid amateur astronomy. But, you know, about three, four months is what this time lapse is. So we have the core of stars in the middle, and we have a supernova that gets bright and then fades away. Gets bright over the span of about two weeks, fades away over the span of maybe three months or so. And that's pretty typical for most supernovas.
supernova we study. These are the supernovae uh, outside of our own galaxy that we study. Uh, some of the remnants, like the crab, are in our own Milky Way. We sometimes can observe those in the nearest by galaxies. But basically, my work and a lot of the supernova stuff, all the supernova I'm going to talk about from the rest of the talk, are in other galaxies like this. And if the supernova is very close by, or it's a, a weird kind of supernova, we can observe it for longer, but sort of a few months is average. Uh, the, I've observed supernova older than myself, decade, many decades old, uh, but those are pretty rare cases. That's, that's definitely not the norm. All right, there's two main ways to create a supernova. You have something that's 10 times or 8 times the mass of the sun or bigger, and it'll collapse on itself at the end of its life. Or you have a pair of stars, and one star steals material from the other, and that could lead to a runaway explosion on a white dwarf star, as we call it. So the sun weighs one times the mass of the sun, so it's not massive enough to explode on its own. It also doesn't have a companion to steal material from, so the sun will never go supernova. But we do know quite a bit. I told you those are the two ways we can mainly get a supernova. And then we've done this pretty cool trick uh, a few times, about a dozen times we've done this. We've taken very high resolution, detailed images of a galaxy, before the supernova went off. So 2005, a telescope in Chile took this picture. In 2008, a supernova went off uh, in this vicinity right around here, hint where the yellow lines are pointing. Uh, and then in 2010, astronomers went back with the same telescope in Chile, took a picture, and that's what they saw. So one more time, 2005, there's a bunch of stars in a galaxy nearby. 2008, a supernova goes off. People observed it from the ground. People got observations of it all over the world. 2010, you go back, that star has disappeared. The other stars are basically the same, that star is gone. It has exploded. Now, of course, there's probably a tiny supernova remnant there, but that's way too faint, we're never gonna be able to observe it. So, that has only been done a couple of times, about a dozen times. You need very detailed images of the galaxy. You have to get lucky and find a star or group of stars where the supernova is gonna go. So people are trying to do this. Uh, it's an ongoing field of research. Very tough to do, but pretty cool. All right, so back to this beautiful picture of our supernova in our nearby galaxy. So why should we care about supernovae? Aside from the fact that, you know, I studied them for well over a decade and up here talking about them, uh, as we heard sort of in Dr. Dustbuster's talk, when we have a star explode, it blows out this material that can turn into dust and gas and jostle nearby clouds, and that's how we get new stars to form. And so you have the death of one star leading directly to the birth of new stars, very circle of life. Many of you know I'm a big Disney fan. You also make heavy elements. So elements up to iron are made inside stars, but would be trapped if it weren't for a supernova. So things like carbon, oxygen, calcium, things we need for life are blown out in uh, supernova explosions and incorporated into new stars and planets. And things heavier than iron, gold, copper, etc., are made only naturally in supernova explosions themselves. So, uh, Carl Sagan used to say we're all made of star stuff, and it sounds very hippie, kumbaya, Berkeley style stuff, but it's literally true. The calcium in your bones, the oxygen we breathe, the, the iron in your blood was cooked up in a star, exploded outward in a supernova about four or five billion years ago, and then incorporated into the sun and the earth and eventually us. And we can use a certain kind of supernova, a type 1a supernova, to track the expansion of the universe, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. And of course, big explosions are awesome. That's honestly how I got into this field in the first place. All right, how about a couple of stars that are going to go supernova soon-ish, with astronomer-ish on the end of that. Uh, one star is Betelgeuse. Uh, many of us know and love Betelgeuse. You've got the three bright stars in Orion's belt, and it's the big orangey-red star that's just above that. You can even see that from downtown Austin in the wintertime, I promise. Uh, also, one of my favorite movies, but that's beside the point. Um, so this star, Betelgeuse, is very big. It's a puffed up red supergiant, as we call it. So here's the size. This is an actual image of the star, one of the first and only stars that we can see the uh, surface of beside the sun. So look how big it is. You plop it down where the sun is right now, and it swallows the first few planets. This is a very big, puffed up star. It weighs about 10 or 20 times the mass of the sun. So it will eventually collapse on itself and explode as a supernova at some point in the next, between tomorrow and a thousand years from now. So in astronomy, that's a really small error bar. That's pretty good. But for you and me, that's uh, maybe not so good. Uh, not as accurate as one might in, uh, want. So keep your eye out. Uh, my advisor at UT, Craig Wheeler, likes to tell his students, you know, go outside in the winter, take a look. If Beetlejuice is still there, great. If it's not, give him a phone call, and we'll start writing papers. <laughs> so keep an eye out for that. Uh, one thing I will point out is it's relatively close by, a couple hundred light years, I believe, uh, but it will not 
burn off the atmosphere. It won't melt your face, Raiders of the Lost Ark style. It will not boil the oceans. It will be bright. It will be visible during the day if it's at the right time of year. It'll cast shadows at night. You'll be able to read by it. But it really won't do any damage. I'll have to go write a lot of papers, maybe get back out of data science, back into astronomy. We'll see. I don't know. Another pretty interesting star uh, that is also going to go supernova in the near-ish future is Eta Carina. Uh, Eta is just a Greek letter. Carina means it is in the constellation of Carina, which is in the southern hemisphere, so we can't see it from Texas. Uh, this is a very interesting star. This was a star that was known to the ancients, known to uh, European Western explorers when they went to the southern hemisphere. It's, it's relatively bright. And then in 1843, it got really bright. Not quite supernova bright, but it got noticeably bright. And then about 10 years later, it faded away again. And so that was weird. Now we go back and take a picture or a series of pictures with the Hubble Space Telescope, and this is what we get. This weird sort of hourglass peanut thing. We got a bright spot in the middle and then this red junk on the outside. So let's break this down. What's going on? So there's a big bright star in the center, maybe 100 or 200 times the mass of the sun that is much smaller than a single pixel in that image. That's the star itself. For scale, this laser pointer dot, just the red dot, is the size of Neptune's orbit. So then we have these huge lobes of material. And so what astronomers did in the 90s and early aughts using Hubble and multiple Hubble images is they measured this distance from the center to the edge and they could measure the speed that this bubble, these are bubbles expanding out into space. They could measure that speed. So we have speed, we have distance. Speed is distance over time. Do some algebra, solve for time. You get 150 years. In the great eruption of Eta Carina in 1843, when it got very bright, it burped off these huge lobes of material, about 10 times the mass of the sun in these eruptions. And this is 100 or 200 times the mass of the sun's star. And we think this reddish, orangey stuff on the outside, that's a similar eruption maybe 20,000 years ago. So this thing has been in its death gurgles for 20,000 years. It is ready to blow. So again, this thing is gonna go supernova at some point between tomorrow and 10,000 years from now. It is further away than Betelgeuse, which is good because it's going to be a more uh, energetic and more powerful explosion when it goes. Again, it will not destroy the Earth, it won't melt your face, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there will be high energy particles that will hit the Earth. So if we have astronauts outside of the protective magnetic field of the Earth, they might be in trouble. Uh, satellites that are in the uh, uh, high Earth orbit might have to power down or go into a safe mode when this thing goes off because those high energy particles could do a little bit of damage. Okay. So how do we find these supernovae? Well, we use telescopes, maybe not surprising, uh, but we use robotic telescopes. A chunk of uh, the supernova are discovered by amateur astronomers around the world, but a lot of them are discovered by robotic automated telescopes. So here's the ROTC telescope out at McDonald Observatory in West Texas. This is run by our group at UT, as well as uh, a group at SMU and some friends at Michigan, University of Michigan. And this is a robotic telescope. It just takes pictures Every night, it knows when the weather is clear, it knows when it's dark, it lives in this little milk can. So it'll pop open its top at night when it's dark and clear, take pictures, and compare new pictures to old pictures. Just like your cell phone camera takes pictures, this thing takes pictures of the night sky of galaxies. And Dr. Dustbuster actually showed this picture on the left-hand side of a galaxy without a supernova. I have the same galaxy taking a picture of it with a supernova on the right-hand side. So what ROTC has to do is take these pictures and compare every dot in both pictures and look for a new bright dot, and maybe that new bright dot is a supernova. So this one is kind of easy because the supernova is pretty bright, but there are a lot of dots, so that makes it harder. Sometimes the supernova is faint and it's hard, sometimes a lot of dots and it's hard. I see a few people pointing so I can move on. There it is. So this was a supernova discovered in 2011 uh, in this beautiful face-on galaxy. Again, we see the core of stars, these beautiful spiral arms, these dark chunks that are due to dust that Dr. Dustbuster just talked about. All right, so I'm going to take a quick aside and show some vacation photos because, you know, I'm up here, I can do what I want. So where did I get a lot of the data that I worked on over the last decade or so in supernova research? Uh, one of the places I got data was from this pair of telescopes, which I know the astronomers in the room are familiar with. Uh, anybody know which telescopes these are? Keck, yeah, my, my AAS friends here know that one. This is the Keck telescopes, uh, 10 meters or 30 feet across. The main mirror is down here, 30 foot diameter. These are on the top of the dormant volcano Mauna Kea in the, on the big island of Hawaii. Uh, for scale, that's a full-size SUV, so these are pretty damn big. Uh, two of the biggest optical telescopes in the world. Uh, here's me, I've really been up to the top, 
uh, just once. I will point out this picture was taken in August in Hawaii. That morning I was on the beach in board shorts and flip flops. You drive up 14,000 feet and it gets freaking cold, even in Hawaii in August. I've got my official Keck Observatory ski jacket, jeans, hiking boots. It was, it was chilly up there. Uh, another telescope that is near and dear to many people's hearts in this room. Uh, anybody recognize this guy? Hobby Eberly Telescope, the HET, uh, slightly smaller than Keck, uh, almost the exact same size nowadays, uh, out at McDonald Observatory in West Texas. Uh, also does a lot of supernova research. Recently come back online, uh, came back online in some uh, engineering and, and practicing mode with a new instrument, new setups, new uh, mirrors, new cameras, all kinds of good stuff. And we are already getting supernova observations with the, the brand new HET upgraded, so that's awesome. Uh, and there's a picture of me and uh, Dr. Paul Robertson, now at Penn State, former UT grad student in front. Here is the main mirror. It's almost horizontal, so it doesn't look quite as impressive, but th this thing is just about 30 feet, a little over 30 feet across. And of course, the good old Hubble Space Telescope. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of myself posing in front of this one. <laughs> But I do like to remind people that this thing is the size of a school bus, and this also is used heavily for supernova research, among lots of other awesome research of people in this room. Uh, so Hubble can look at even further and fainter away objects uh, than ROTC. And in fact, that's what was done in the late 90s. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and some of the biggest telescopes on the Earth were used to observe even further away supernova. So ROTC finds supernova that are a mere 200 million light years away. Whereas Hubble and some of the bigger telescopes on Earth down in Chile and out in Hawaii, they can find supernovae that are a billion light years away. So in 1997, this was uh, the furthest, uh, this is the record holder at that time, about a billion light years away. Uh, in 1990, uh, I'm sorry, in 2013, uh, the most recent record holder for supernova is about 1.4 billion light years away. So for people who study really high redshift stuff like MC high Z, that's nothing, but for supernova that was pretty cool. Okay, so why do we care about these furthest away ones? So these are the type 1a supernova. These are the ones that we can look at the expansion of the universe using. And we can look at very far away ones using Hubble. So why do we care? What's, what's going on here? So a quick aside, uh, the Hubble expansion. Uh, in the 1920s, Edwin Hubble and a bunch of other astronomers figured out that all galaxies are moving away from each other. The universe is expanding. Uh, so here is a picture of Hubble, the namesake of the Hubble Space Telescope, back in the good old days where you could smoke your pipe right at the telescope. <laughs> they, they frown on that nowadays. <laughs> you got to smoke your stuff in the control room, Edwin. Come on. Okay, so everything is moving away from each other. All galaxies are moving away, away from each other. The universe is expanding. All galaxies have mass. They have t stars and dust, all those ingredients, and Pokemon that Dr. Dustbuster was talking about. And Newton told us that if you have stuff like Pokemon and dust, you're gonna pull on each other through the force of gravity. And so all of this expansion is going to be pulling on each other. These galaxies are pulling on each other, and that should slow down the expansion with time. And so that's what these distant uh, supernovae were set out to be measure, uh, measuring in the late 90s, this slowdown of the expansion. And what happened, many of you know the end of this story, but what was really weird and they found out was that for everything we knew about cosmology, the history of the universe, physics, astronomy, etc., these supernovae were indicating that the universe was expanding faster and faster every day. The universe's expansion was accelerating. That is weird. That is, you throw the laser pointer in the air instead of coming back into my hand, which I'm not gonna do. Okay, I'll do it. Oh, I did it. So instead of coming back down, it zooms through the ceiling. That is effing weird. Why would that happen? We don't know. This is freaking bizarre. And this is what we've now termed dark energy. So this was uh, discovered in like 97, 98. People thought supernova people were sort of, you know, smoking something funny. Maybe they didn't know what they were talking about. Maybe supernova were just wrong. Since then, many other fields of astronomy, totally different, not involving supernovae, have since seen this accelerating expansion, measured a very similar amount of the accelerating expansion. And so in 2011, the Nobel Prize for Physics was awarded to these, these three fellas for the discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe through observations of distant supernovae. Uh, I will quickly point out that I was just at a conference last week. Some of you see me on Facebook, saw that I was out on Easter Island, which was super amazing for a supernova conference. Uh, Brian Schmidt was there. I would say decently good friend of mine. Uh, we were staying in the same cabin. That was cool, we drank a lot together. Uh, the other thing I like to point out about Brian is he owns a winery in Australia, and he gets his grad students and postdocs to pick grapes, and you know, it fluctuates year to year. So I've, 
I've had the best of his wine that you, you can only get it in Australia. I've had the best of his wine that goes for like a hundred bucks a bottle. And I've had the like cooking version of the wine. So it goes through cycles. Uh, it is quite tasty. He's a great guy. The other two guys aren't bad, but Brian's, <laughs> Brian's awesome. All right, so the last bit I'll close here with is the composition of the universe. We don't know a lot about dark energy. Pro tip, if an astronomer says dark something, it means we don't know what the hell we're talking about. So dark energy, we do know, makes up a good chunk of the universe, 68, 73%, something like that, right around 70% of the universe of all of its mass and energy is in dark energy. Uh, dark matter is another 27%. We've had a few talks uh, at AOTATX about that over the months. 4% uh, is intergalactic gas, basically hot hydrogen between galaxies. And then we're left with 1% of stars, which, and also planets and other stuff, kitties, puppies, monkeys, you and me. Uh, we're, of course, a tiny, tiny fraction of that 1%. So at this point, you're probably pretty depressed and sad. We're a tiny, tiny sliver in this. But I will point out, and uh, my PhD advisor, Alex Filipenko, likes to point this out too. As far as we know, of this whole pie chart, we're the only chunk that can sit here and stand here and drink beer and talk about it and think about it. So maybe that makes you feel better. And with that, I'll end and take questions. Thanks. All right, thanks, Jeff. All right, questions? Uh, right here. When you were showing Eta Crena in the various stages that it's been expanding and, and all gassing in a sense, do we know if supernova have a certain time frame at which they kind of go through this death row, or does it, is it very based on the type of star? So the question was about Eta Carina, the star with the big lobes and the sort of outer stuff and going through its death throes. And do we know if stars go through sort of similar time scale uh, explosions or mini explosions or burping off versus when it explodes? And the answer is, we think there's a range of depending on what kind of star, how big it is, if there's two stars or just one, and you know what kind of stuff it's going to throw off. Uh, but the real answer is, I'm currently working on it. I'm still finishing up a couple of papers. I've written a couple of papers on various kinds of stars and what they burp off and when. We have an observing program at McDonald's Observatory that's specifically looking for the time scale for various exploding stars and when they burp stuff off. Because we will see that after the supernova explodes into that material it burped off. Hey, yeah, right here. Uh, you talked about So the question was about uh, will we get a warning uh, for the Eta Carina supernova and like trying to turn off satellites and stuff. Uh, so the warnings that we will get from supernova because they travel basically instantly from when the supernova explodes at the speed of light will be neutrinos, slightly less than the speed of light, but pretty close. They get out very quickly after the explosion. So for the question about neutrino detection earlier, certain kinds of supernova do become bright in neutrinos, and we'll see those. Uh, certain kinds of supernova will emit gravitational waves instantaneously from the explosion, and then they travel at the speed of light. So people are going to look for gravitational waves, which we've heard about many times over the last few months. Uh, so if we can detect those quickly, we will get a little bit of a warning. Certain kinds of supernova won't do that, and then the light will follow when it gets here, and so we will try to quickly <laughs> turn everything off or put it into a safe mode uh, before other more damaging stuff gets here. But yeah, it, it could be pretty close or no warning at all for certain kinds of explosions. Right here. So the question was what would happen to astronauts in space if we had the supernova go off? It would be similar to a very strong uh, solar flare. You get high energy, high uh, mass particles hitting them. So for my comic book nerd friends, this would be a Fantastic Four type issue. <laughs> uh, and based off of at least the movies, God, I hope we don't have this happen to astronauts, <laughs> but the comics are good. Right in the front row here, Adam. How yeah. About? Oh, great question. So how would James Webb Space Telescope help us find supernova? So this is a new telescope coming out uh, from uh, NASA and the Europeans, launching in a couple of years. Lots of people have talked about this at AOT before. Uh, James Webb is going to be looking in the infrared. I've mostly talked about optical visible light we can see with our eyes. Infrared, slightly longer wavelength, but that means it's also going to be bigger than Hubble, and it'll see into the red, so we can see even further and farther away. So we're going to find even farther away supernova, even younger in the history of the universe. So so MC Hi-Z and various other people are working on trying to figure out plans for what should we look at with James Webb. And all of the supernova people are like, well, while you're looking, see if there's a new bright spot. And maybe that's a new supernova. 
So this is a serious plan, and yeah, we'll find that we'll definitely break the distant supernova record in the first two weeks of observations with Webb, possibly. I right, probably have time for one more question up here. Great question. So the question was, uh, is there a constant or a rate of stars uh, going supernova? So supernova rates are a whole subfield of supernova work that I try to keep out of because the uncertainties are huge and it's a tough, tough game. Uh, the number we like to throw around is in the entire universe, there's about 10 supernova per second. Most of the time we don't see them, they're too far away. We find maybe 10 to 20 each 24 hour period each day from Earth. So we're missing a lot of them, but that's because they're way far away. For a given galaxy, for a Milky Way-like galaxy, these sort of normal spiral galaxies like the one in the picture, like the one I, uh, we live in, the number is about one per 100 years. One supernova per 100 years is the average that we like to kick around. All right, well, let's thank MC Super Duper Nova, Super Duper Nova again. All right, so uh, now we'll have a 20-minute intermission.